Testing. Testing, testing. Great.
Um, we've had a crazy year. We've hosted 50. Oh, wow. No, we've had um, 54 events this academic year. Um, so we're super happy to have all five of them of these graduates have participated in all of them. Um, and they're five of 18 that will be graduating and walking in the next two weeks. Um, so thank you for giving me that opportunity to be your student, your classmates. Um, and I can't wait to see what you do. Um, before I hand it off to our new SUPSO president, um, I do want to mention that our program just got reaccredited by the Planning Accreditation Board for the next five years. Um, but that success wouldn't have happened without our lovely program director, um, Sandra. Yes. So thank you for that. That's super successful. So, um, I'm going to give you some flowers for allowing us to succeed and to continue to succeed. So, of course. Okay, and I would like now to introduce our new SUPSO president, Megan Potier. 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 Excellent. still getting used to it. Thank you, Christian. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Pottier, and I'm really excited to be the student organization president for the next year. Um, I want to congratulate all of our graduates from this year. I'm really excited to see your presentations, um, both because I'm interested in planning and because I have no idea what to do for my capstone. So I'm hoping to get some inspiration. Um, I want to also congratulate the current board, um, Christian, and everybody who served this year was a lot of fun, so many events, and I, I can't believe that you all pulled it off with the energy and passion, and it made everybody coming into SUPSO really excited to be here. Um, you all were so warm and welcoming, and it was really easy to feel like we belonged. Um, so I'm hoping that we're able to continue that legacy of hospitality going forward with our board. Um, and just thank you all again for being here. We're really, really excited for our graduates to become alumni and keep working with them. And I would like to um, acknowledge any current SUPSO board members who are present. Could you please stand? Anna. Come stand, <laughs> yay. And then we have our incoming board members, other board members, Megan and Anna is our, our vice president. And who else is here? There's someone else. Oh, there you are, and Ashley's back there. And Reagan, had, Reagan, who greeted you as you came in, is also on our new board. So welcome to our, our new student leadership. And now I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to our capstone presenters. Our first presenter is Robera. And um, you're going to really be impressed by Robera because everyone who meets him is really impressed by Robera. His project is really, really cool. And he's worked so hard on it for over a year. So I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to Robera. Right. Hey. I think we were supposed to flip your slides. Oh, I see. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for attending uh, this presentation uh, today. Um, I want to thank a couple of people before I get started. I want to thank my advisor, uh, like Sandra mentioned. Uh, he's been working patiently with me for a year. Um, so thanks for the adventure. Uh, I want to thank uh, my uh, faculty members and professors here, uh, fellow students, um, and my uh, love of my life. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it and the support. Okay, uh, so let's get started with the uh, presentation. Um, I know that initially the title said, uh, take this off, uh, initially said, uh, 
to, that I would be covering the um, suburbs of DC. So after we experimented a little bit, we decided to stick to one county. So initially we were thinking Prince George County and Montgomery County, uh, but we will be focused on uh, Montgomery County uh, for the most part. So we will be exploring um, the transit corridors uh, and housing along those lines. Um, uh, so I'll start with a brief introduction of the topic, uh, provide a background and some context, uh, our, um, how we collected our data and methodology, the results, and some discussions and insights we drew from the study. All right, so the main question that uh, I looked at in this uh, project is whether transit-oriented development in Montgomery County is family-friendly. Um, so as many of you know, uh, for those of you in the CESPO program, um, TOD is uh, walkable, compact, mixed-use development um, that usually has a higher density uh, of people and goods and services. Um, and as a rule of thumb, it's within half a mile uh, distance from a, a, a mass transit. Um, and the other part of this question is family friendliness. So there's many ways you could define that. Uh, I think our faculty, uh, uh, Lou Thomas would probably answer that uh, better. Uh, our research, though, is just focused on number of bedrooms and proximity. So uh, I'll be focusing on that. All right, so for background, uh, this project was uh, somewhat takes place uh, with the uh, release of the uh, Thrive 2050, uh, uh, the comprehensive plan for Montgomery County. Uh, it, the goal of the, the, the comprehensive plan is to create compact and uh, corridor-focused development. Um, initially, this idea was conceived in the 1960s, um, and they had a vision to develop uh, the county along the corridors of 270, I-95, and Route 29. And eventually, they decided to just focus on I-270, and you see that there's a significant difference in terms of the outcome based on, on that type of development. Um, but they did not get the result they wanted. Uh, it wasn't uh, a, a corridor and dense type of development uh, that, that we saw in the county over the years since then. Uh, there was sprawl uh, and you know, you'd have to move further if you wanted to own a single family uh, type of housing. And, and that's essentially the state of affairs today. All right, so why do this project now? There's two major projects that are happening. Uh, as many of you are familiar, perhaps about, you know, about the first one, the Purple Line. Uh, the Purple Line connects Prince George County to Montgomery County, starting with uh, New Carlton connecting all the way to Bethesda. That's uh, over 16 miles and it connects to existing um, metro stations or metro lines. And then there's the BRT, which we included as part of this project as well. BRT stands for Bus Rapid, Rapid Transit. There's currently only one active line uh, in Montgomery County and that's the Orange Line. All right, so data and methodology. Um, so we got our data from Montgomery County uh, GIS database. Uh, they had uh, the shape files that we're looking for, uh, transit stations, census tracts, and zoning breakdown, and also the American Community Survey uh, for demographic and uh, socioeconomic economic data. Um, the transit lines that, uh, or the the transit systems that we looked at uh, are four. It's the BRT, the Metro, the MARC, uh, and uh, the, um, this thing is blocking me. Um, well, it's in there. Uh, uh, Metro, MARC, BRT, uh, and 
Uh, wow. Okay. Sorry, I'm blanking out. Okay. Um, so uh, to do our uh, analysis, we used um, a, uh, a regression analysis. So we had a response and an explanatory variable. Uh, the response variable is the average number of bedrooms uh, and the explanatory variable, thank you, is the proximity to metro. And uh, for control, we used uh, median household income, percent of uh, owner-occupied units and average household size. Uh, so some of these may seem um, intuitive because, you know, when you... Uh, Essentially, income dictates whether you can live close to the metro, and if you want to, uh, if you're moving further away from the metro and buying a house, then you need a higher income, and ownership uh, will tend to increase as you're further away from the metro, and so on. And the same goes for household size. Uh, so, uh, how do we determine proximity? We use the uh, a centroid for a census tract, and then find the close closest. Um, transit station. So it's not a perfect system, but uh, it gives us a picture of what, what it's like in Montgomery County in terms of access to transit. So for analysis, we did a simple uh, a linear and uh, multivariate regression. Uh, we used the latter to control for, um, uh, for, to use for our control variables. All right, so the result uh, is not, uh, Surprising, uh, there's a, a, a positive correlation between um, proximity to metro and uh, number of bedrooms available. So the closer you are to the metro, uh, the fewer the number of bedrooms that are available. Um, and this, uh, what you see on the right is the multivariate regression analysis. And it shows basically that, um, that the number diminishes slightly the coefficient uh, but but overall uh, that, that that there's a correlation and that it's um, statistically significant all right a few discussions and insights some uh, factors to consider um, zoning uh, in Montgomery County is is kind of a big deal um, similar to many other counties like Montgomery County um, nearly 43 percent of the census tracts are zoned for single family. Uh, in terms of area, that's about 35 percent of the county. And only 29 percent is zoned for multi-family and mixed use. So the green up top is for single family and, and the second one in blue is for multi-family. Um, I tried to run a number to see, uh, to measure TODness. Uh, how close, uh, you know, if the, the official figure is you have to be half a mile uh, to be considered a transit-oriented uh, development. So to, to just kind of get a sense of how many of those tracts would, would, would actually be TODs. And it's about 16% for single-family uh, areas zoned for single-family and 19% for multifamily. So that just lets you know that this is... Uh, they're about the same, meaning that it's not, um, it's, it's, uh, it's unequitable, uh, meaning that there's the other development is more dense and would have more people, uh, but would have essentially the same no, uh, level of access as um, area zone for single family. All right, so in conclusion, um, the main message is avoid repeating history. They initially were in the same historical con conjuncture as before. Uh, we, the, the big picture ideas, transit uh, uh, corridor uh, style of development in Montgomery County, uh, the same as the planned in the 1960s. Um, so what we can do differently or what the county can do differently is to build more family friendly units near transit uh, more three and four bedrooms, um, support transit-oriented development by, multi, uh, by creating multifamily-friendly zoning. So um, 
making sure that the areas currently only zoned for single family are also zoned for multifamily because they have the same amount of uh, or very comparable level of access to, to transit. And the last point being to ensuring that it's equitable. So as I was saying earlier, uh, our controls included income and uh, household size and uh, uh, one other factor, for some reason I'm blanking out, but um, to, to make sure that it's equitable, uh, it has to be affordable for everybody and it has to support different types of um, different types of uh, housing. Uh, yeah, I just, so the variable was owner occupied. So whether somebody wants to own or not, uh, sh there shouldn't be a very strong correlation like that showing that you'd have to move further away to, to own your property. Um, all right, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, so the, the question is, uh, if we saw, uh, housing types that held vouchers, um, for public housing, um, yeah, that's a very good question. And I think that goes into like the future, uh, of the type of, uh, development that we need to happen to make it e equitable, uh, in terms of affordability. Um, but in our research, we simply just looked at um, uh, the availability of bedrooms. So whether it's affordable or not, just within close to the metro, uh, is it even available to start with? Yep, that's a very good question as well. Um, so it would be, yeah, no, I'm sorry. The question is, in, in order not to repeat the history uh, or the mistake of the past, what kind of stakeholders would you need to, to have together or uh, who do you need to advocate to? Um, so um, it, it would have to be that the people living in Montgomery County, uh, because residents have a lot to say, the planning board, uh, the planners, um, so it would be a combination uh, of those people um, and other stakeholders, uh, organizations that have uh, an interest in, in the county. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, Rosetta. I'm going to bring up our. Oh. 
I'll bring up our next presenter, Bianca Box. Um, Bianca, are you ready? Can you hear me? You can. Wonderful. Love it. All right. So thank you, Sandra, and <clears throat> thank you all for for being here or, or watching online. Um, my name is Bianca, and my capstone project is not. You cannot hear me. Better. Yeah. Oh, I can hear myself. My name is Bianca, and this is my capstone project. Um, basically, conducting an analysis of homelessness policies, specifically housing first, and creating a best practice guide and um, set of evaluation tools for identifying um, both policy and implementation gaps. So modern homelessness, as we understand it in this country, really emerged from events and actions that happened throughout the 60s and the 80s, um, like urban renewal, massive federal cutbacks um, from various programs and services that have unfortunately perpetuated so today. Um, with things like <clears throat> an inadequate affordable housing stock, um, stagnant wages, um, lacking supportive social services, and in cities in particular, um, rising population that is being is that is outpacing housing production, which then further drives up the price. And so that has perpetuated till today, um, where there's unfortunately um, some pretty staggering statistics around homelessness. Um, one in every 14 Americans will experience homelessness at some point in their life um, with every $100 increase in rent in a city. Homelessness increases by 9%. Um, and the public sector alone pays anywhere between thirty dollars and $50,000 a year per person experiencing homelessness. And so there's a very real social and economic cost um, to homelessness being a persistent and chronic um, issue in this country. And so, um, I kind of wanted to frame this project around, well, what, what can planners do? How can we um, incorporate ourselves into the homelessness response system um, to make improvements? So uh, homelessness is currently being um, uh, approached in a, a multifaceted way, but I just wanted to highlight two um, key pieces, both on the policy and implementation side. Um, first are continuums of care, or COCs, as I might refer to them, which are regional bodies, um, <clears throat> quasi-governmental agencies, excuse me, that um, can apply for and directly receive funding from HUD um, to implement different um, homelessness services and, and programs. And it's a, it's a combination of different community organizations, nonprofits, um, to come together with a, a shared vision, access that federal funding, and then use it in their communities. <clears throat> On the policy side, um, what many experts and the federal government as well believed to be the most effective and best practice for um, homelessness policies is called housing first. And as the, the name suggests, um, it's, a, it's a principle a philosophy that says, let's get people into housing first, and then we can address the rest of the underlying issues that they might be facing. Um, the flip side of housing first is treatment first, um, which says that people need to meet a certain threshold, they need to go through certain programs and, and meet certain requirements before they're placed in housing. And, and while that might sound intuitive, um, I came across a good analogy in my my research for housing first, and it's that if you are drowning, it does not help you if your rescuer insists that you first learn how to swim before they bring you to land. And that's not to make light of the situation, but housing first says, let's bring you to land first, let's address your immediate need, and then we'll, we will address the underlying issues that you also might be facing. So um, with that understanding that housing first is a uh, a tried and true method in, in terms of um, it's been tested and has been proven to be very effective. <clears throat> Why then is homelessness still so pervasive and um, increasing and getting worse? Um, since 2016, homelessness uh, rates have risen by 5%. And so that was kind of the focus of my analysis, um, my gap analysis as I'm calling it, um, to understand what are those policy side and implementation gaps um, in the system. And so to do that, it was, it was primarily through a literature review um, supplemented with some, some GIS mapping um, to add that spatial component. Um, and then I created um, resources for, for planners or anyone really um, to try to wrap your arms around this very complex topic and at least have a, a place to start. So this gap analysis, um, these are the main, at a very high level, main areas I looked at. Um, first, the elements of housing first. Um, it's not enough to just implement a housing first policy. You need to make sure you have the, the elements and the pieces in place to actually make sure it's effective and successful on the ground. Federal funding, 
um, the, the federal government by far has the most um, money, is putting the most money into homelessness programs and services. I believe the most recent um, fiscal year 23 budget that was approved had over $6 billion with a B um, allocated toward homelessness programs across federal agencies. And so how is that funding being accessed? Um, who is it, how is it being used? Is it being used to its fullest extent? And then public-private partnerships, which will be a continuing theme throughout my, my presentation. Um, are we bringing in other sectors and not making this just a public sector issue? Okay, so from those gap areas, these are, again, at a very high level, the, the policy and implementation gaps that I found. On the policy side, um, there are demographic gaps. Um, often, you know, federal uh, agencies have to um, make very narrow definitions of who can qualify for what. So whether that's um, veterans experiencing homelessness, families experiencing homelessness, um, gap areas start to form when people don't fit into um, a subgroup, um, a defined subgroup. And so even though there are some programs out there that do apply for, apply to everyone, um, then we get into the inadequate and lacking services side that preclude them from accessing the services that they might qualify for, whether that's transportation needs, healthcare needs, um, behavioral and disability needs. And then lastly, um, which I'll get more into in my next slide, are collaborate, gaps in collaboration and leveraging resources across, across sectors. So I kind of take a deeper dive into the private sector and nonprofit sector, really, um, into understanding how they can potentially fill those gap areas that we identified. Um, and to first do that, we need to understand their motivations. Why would they ever come to the table to help in this area? And so I went through kind of these main entities that somewhat work in the, the homelessness affordable housing space already to try to understand what their motivations are. No surprise that developers are motivated by money and financial reasons. Um, there are many um, incentive programs out there that, would, um, that could be put into place to bring them to the table. Banks and financial institutions um, are motivated by regulatory means. Um, there's something called the Federal Community Reinvestment Act, and that basically says that banks and federal uh, financial institutions have to offer community benefits to the areas that they serve. The same is true for hospitals. Um, the majority of hospitals in this country are nonprofit, meaning that they're tax exempt. And so in order for them to keep that precious you know, tax exemption, um, they have to provide community benefits to the areas they serve as well, which include um, subsidized housing and those wraparound social services that relate to healthcare. And then lastly, faith-based organizations are arguably the most underutilized um, piece of this puzzle. Um, they often already are already uh, very active in this space. Um, on any given night, two out of five emergency beds, emergency shelter beds across the country are provided by faith-based organizations. Um, they often already have a very activated um, volunteer base. Um, they're very connected to their communities. And they have donor funds um, that could be utilized with other services if, if they're brought to the table. So to wrap all of that together, I um, mean, going through those evaluation steps and that, that gap analysis, I also did a couple of case studies. Um, I did a deeper dive on Houston, Texas, and Denver, Colorado. And then I also did a more high level <clears throat> cursory case study of the other four cities listed. Um, and for the sake of time, I will not get into all of them. Um, but I will leave you with Houston by far is one that has a very um, good success story in this area. Um, they've implemented a housing first policy. They brought all sectors to the table and they've decreased their homelessness population by 63% since 2011. All of that while not really using any city money. They've used other pots of money to have that success. And so you can read my paper if you'd like to more, learn more about it or, or look it up, but there's a, lot, there's a lot out there on Houston. And so getting into the resources that I then kind of created from that analysis, um, we have this decision tree, and I apologize for the small text, but it basically goes through the same process, the exact same process I just walked uh, you all through. Um, and this could be a, a resource, um, a reference for planners to uh, go back to to evaluate their own jurisdictions. Do you have a housing first policy in place? Okay, great. Do you have all the elements that you need for it to be successful? Are you leveraging um, all the potential federal and state money that's out there? Um, and then are you um, accessing and utilizing the private and nonprofit sector um, appropriately, and that just goes through those those questions. Um, to accompany that, I mentioned I did some GIS mapping as well, um, just to serve as an additional tool um, to supplement that that gap analysis, um, and to bring it back to uh, GIS is often a tool that planners use already, 
And so it shouldn't be left out of the equation here either. Many of the, the risk factors that um, will lead to um, people experiencing homelessness can be mapped spatially. And these are just examples from Denver, how um, that plays out on a map and can be very powerful and a collaboration tool for, for planners. And then lastly, I wrapped all of my, my paper and my analysis up into kind of a three-page fact sheet for, uh, for planners, or again, for anyone who wants to just you know, dip your toe in this area and understand, um, begin to understand all the factors at play. And so um, all the information is, is the same, just with some graphics and, again, condensed down to the three pages. And so lastly, um, relating this back to the relevance for planners and the profession, um, those overarching issues that I mentioned, inadequate housing stock, stagnant wages, are unfortunately, unfortunately not really improving quickly in this country right now. And so affordable housing is becoming increasingly out of reach. And that's what this, this graphic is showing. Um, it's from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Also recommend going to their, their website. They have a lot of great data. But this shows how, um, in this case, this is a snapshot from Virginia, um, a person working at $11 an hour minimum wage would have to work 78 hours a week to afford a modest one bedroom rental unit. And this is Virginia's 14th on the list, so you can imagine how high those, those um, weekly hours go up. And so it's kind of a charge or a challenge to planners um, to take hold of this issue, um, to again, fill, understand that gap analysis and strengthen collaborative partnerships um, in our roles. And then lastly, um, the APA or the American Planning Association has an adopted policy guide on homelessness. Um, with some very specific charges and policy guidances for planners um, that include incorporating um, the population experiencing homelessness into comprehensive plans and land use and housing elements, um, specifically uh, challenging planners to um, be a bridge and act as a, and encourage collaboration across departments, offices, sectors, um, and bring everyone to the table to have shared um, goals when it's, it relates to this issue. And then lastly, the policy guide specifically challenges planners, the APA, and its chapters to be in a leadership role to, to educate other planners and other people that work in the sector um, on how things like a diverse housing stock can benefit people experiencing homelessness. And so I say all that to say um, this is definitely an area where planners can and should be involved. And um, this evaluation, this gap analysis is just one way to, to approach it. So yeah, thank you all for listening. I also wanted to say thank you to Professor Dr. John Thomas for being my mentor, uh, without which none of this would be possible. Andrew Burnish, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he's here, but another professor, thank you um, for, reading, <laughs> for reading through my project and giving me feedback. Uh, Sandra Whitehead, uh, of course, for leading the way through the program and all the, the students and faculty that I've got a chance to, to meet. I appreciate it. So Madeline is going to run the mic around if there are questions. But first, I wanted to see if there are questions from our online viewers. No, not yet. All right, Maddie, are there questions in the room? Back to Luke. Hi. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Just one question. Uh, what inspired you to choose this topic? Thank you for asking that. Um, I believe it's quoting Raven from last year, quoting Sandra, but uh, a rising tide doesn't lift all boats if everyone doesn't have a boat. Um, and I can't help but think that we can't really address other huge, you know, overarching issues in this country or elsewhere in the world if we can't first take care of um, people who are experiencing the confluence of all those negative factors. And so um, it, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have any, um, I guess, personal a story to tell for why I picked this topic, but um, I just feel like it's really important to understand um, that aspect of the, the built environment and planners are often already kind of, you know, on the periphery. And so I wanted to take a deeper dive in this project. Uh, hi, uh, with like what you said at the beginning about the correlation between rent prices and homelessness and then what you said at the, about, at the end about like, the diversity of housing stock and homelessness, um, like how much of the contrast you saw in the success of uh, Houston and Denver would you say is like attributable to their 
like housing first policies versus just like, you know, Houston is generally thought of as being like very lax in its land use regulations, whereas the Denver area is like very, very constrictive. Great question. Thank you for asking. That is a big reason why Houston is such a success story is because of their, their zoning situation. Um, <clears throat> but their, the way that they brought multiple sectors to the table and access federal funding by far was um, a big part of that success. As well as their political will, their, their mayors across time, multiple mayors, were all bought in on housing first and made it a priority. And so they had the political backing. <clears throat> in Denver, it is a little more conservative in that way, um, but they have done, um, I'm forgetting the acronym now, it's in my paper. Um, but they um, conducted basically an initiative on housing first in, in a very controlled way to look at um, how people had less visits to the hospital, fewer interactions with law enforcement, all the all you know fewer instances in those factors and so um, they were trying to use that data to encourage their you know their policies to lean more into actually adopting a, a full-fledged housing first policy so um, I'm not sure if that if that fully answers the question but it's definitely a factor for sure we have an online question um, I believe this is from Garrett Johnson one of our alums great job did you explore housing court reform what was the second one? housing did you explore housing court reform? Housing court reform? I'm not sure exactly what that is. Thank you, though. I will. Thank you. Wait, show me this. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Sarah Berlick, and I'll be speaking to you about public involvement in Arlington, Virginia. So, a brief overview of my presentation. We'll step through some introduction and background. Uh, contrary to everyone else, I do not have any GIS analysis in my study. Uh, it's all talking, um, not, not, not a lot of pretty pictures. So, I apologize in advance. Um, and then we'll get through my case study results and the discussions and recommendations of my analysis. So some initial, and can you hear me? Okay, it's, okay, okay, great. Um, some initial uh, framing for my paper. Uh, I live in Arlington County, I have for the last four years. I'm an active member of our Park and Recreation Commission. So I was approaching this project as a citizen just as much as I was approaching it as a planner. Um, I spend, uh, a lot of time engaged as a citizen, almost as much as I spend in school, um, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, so that is a big aspect of this analysis. So the Arlington Way, if anyone lives in Arlington, you've, you've heard about the Arlington Way. Um, the biggest question I was trying to answer with this paper is, is the Arlington Way working? So we have this longstanding tradition in Arlington where public involvement is uh, very ingrained in the county practices politically, procedurally uh, for anything. The smallest project has public meetings and citizen commission briefings and all of that. Um, and this is celebrated by our county leaders. They promote this. We've won awards from the American Planning Association for our public involvement approaches. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if it is still applicable. We've had a lot of changes in the county over the last 10 to 20 years that are really, for me, as a newer resident, calling into question, you know, are these practices actually the best way we could be doing this? Um, we've seen demographic changes where the population is getting younger, family sizes are changing, household sizes are getting smaller. Um, we're also seeing an increase in renters as new housing stock is added in the transit corridors as primarily apartments or rental units. Um, so for me, I wanted to bring this to a broader analysis of public involvement tradition as a whole and how it's evolved over the course of the history of urban planning. So this is a very, uh, very high level summary of a four or five page literature review. Um, public involvement has been evolving alongside planning practice. We, we learn about this in our courses. As long as we've had planning, there has been some form of the public involvement and it's always changing. And there are two watershed moments that I found that I think are most pertinent to conversations about public involvement today. That is after, uh, in response to urban renewal and the environmental movement in the mid 20th century, we saw the legal codification of public involvement mechanisms. We're talking 
planning commissions became required by state law across the country. Public hearing and comment periods at all levels of the government became like a legally required process. And I'm not confident that's always a good thing, which I'll talk about. Um, and then the second watershed moment is kind of on the tails of that legal codification. We get ad advocacy planning and the environmental justice movement saying, wait a second, 20 years ago, we thought this was the solution, but all of these problems are still here and it's clearly not working. How can we kind of evolve this and adapt this process moving forward? Um, and that conversation is still very much happening today. So in summary, current processes uh, don't work. The public comment and hearing process <laughs> That's it, that's the paper. Um, no, the public comment and hearing process leads to polarization, which is not great for community dialogue. In a public comment space, uh, citizens have to feel like they have to be the loudest person in the room to be heard. And that leads to an escalation of their perspective, which is not necessary or not productive to reaching you know, community dialogue. Uh, we also see things like citizens commissions have trouble recruiting or maintaining adequate diversity, which has a big problem in uh, leading to inequitable outcomes because the uh, full breadth of the community is not at the table. Um, these processes are biased towards the already privileged. We're talking higher educated, more wealthy, landowners all have more privilege in these spaces than their counterparts. And these processes, as a result of all these factors, echo, just keep echoing the same opinions over and over again, and we don't hear the new voices and the underrepresented voices at the table. So that's all great, but like, what does this mean in the real world, right? Um, so I have, this is actually five frameworks, but two of them are very similar um, that I use to guide an analysis of four different case studies that I'll speak about in a moment. Uh, the first two columns here are very focused on public involvement from the citizen's perspective. So we're starting with Arnstein's ladder of citizen participation. I'm seeing a lot of nods. Um, you took land use law, you listened to Sandra, you know that one, um, and some responses to that. And then on this side, we have uh, public involvement from the planner's perspective. So not, this is outcome based, this is intent based, right? We're talking two different sides of the conversation. And I applied both uh, in, in an attempt to understand how did Arlington's missing middle housing study compare against comparable case studies? So Arlington's missing middle housing study, quick show of hands, who reads local news? Have you heard about this? Yeah, that's pretty much everyone in the room for those of you who are online and can't see. Um, so this is a recent, very recent public event where we're looking at how can we uh, reform single family zoning in Arlington County for increased housing density. Involvement around this process included a mixture of in-person and online involvement because the activities began kind of 2019, tail of the kind of peak of the COVID pandemic before we had vaccines. So there were a lot of in-person meetings. Um, a key factor here, involvement began after the existing conditions report was published, which I'll speak about uh, kind of later on in the presentation. And then if you're reading local news, the last bullet point is probably very familiar. This had a lot of public controversy in the final stages. I mean, we're talking days before the county board vote, and there was no, there was very strong and, and stark contrast in public opinion on this topic. The next case study I looked at was the Montgomery County's downtown Silver Spring and adjacent communities sector plan, which did not fit in the title block, so I apologize to Silver Spring residents. Um, this was very different in intent from the other projects as a sector plan update. Engagement also happened primarily in 2020, so exclusively online involvement activities. Um, in this case, we saw involvement concurrent with the planning process, holding hands the entire way, not two separate processes, but the same one with, with two sets of meetings. And also a key factor here is neighborhood specific visioning workshops, um, which I'll speak more about later on. The next two case studies are both similar to Missing Middle. So the first one is Durham, North Carolina, which had primarily in-person involvement. This was pre-2019, um, so before the, the onslaught of virtual meetings. Um, and this case study had a very unique approach with this practitioner's panel, which served as an advisory group to the process, but represented exclusively housing developers. Um, which is a very interesting approach to a conversation about, you know, housing and land use changes when we're talking about reforming single family zoning. Uh, and second, and lastly here, we have involvement fully concurrent with the planning process. The last case study is the Portland Residential Info Project, which is the mother of all missing middle housing studies. Um, this one uh, stands out from the others with a pretty comprehensive stakeholder advisory committee that had biweekly meetings with planning staff throughout the entire process to provide intermediate feedback on draft recommendations and, and study framing. Um, but despite all of that, this one also, just like Arlington, had very high levels of controversy in the final stages. Um, in the phase where this 
a proposal was in front of elected officials and appointed planning commissioners for approval. Uh, the city received over 22,000 public comments on the proposal, which just speaks to kind of the level of discourse around this one. So some initial conclusions here. Um, all of the case studies saw decreasing public involvement as the process moved through the um, planning process, which makes sense when you think about it as the plan solidifies, there's less of a need to have visioning workshops and things of that nature. But at the same time, um, none of the uh, processes achieved like true power sharing is a vision by Arnstein. Um, if you look at the top of Arnstein's ladder, she's talking like true full delegation of power to the citizens where they have complete control over the process. And I didn't see that in any of these case studies. Um, I think a couple of them, like Durham and Portland and Montgomery County achieved higher levels than Arlington did. But at the end of the day, none of them are striving for that top goal. And I think that's intentional. I think planners today typically use public involvement as an extra source of information alongside the technical process and not as a uh, like delegation of power and uh, engaging the citizens in that way. And then another big theme across all of them was there was no published trans performance evaluation and very minimal kind of goal setting at the beginning of the process, which when you're writing a capstone about the performance of certain public involvement mechanisms is very big limitation on your analysis if no one's actually talking about how well it worked. Um, so that's a big uh, part of my conclusion is, you know, we need to see more of this um, and citizens need to see more of this. And there, there's an importance to that. And then in the non Arlington case studies, um, three things, three themes I saw was I mentioned this already involvement concurrent with the planning process and all the other case studies. There were um, visioning sessions held with citizens while the existing conditions research was ongoing, which I think is a key factor that sets those case studies apart from Arlington. We also see stakeholder advisory groups, uh, which Arlington has implemented in previous studies, but not this one. Um, and then place-based visioning and specifically grounding public involvement in the built environment. Something Portland did was the stakeholder advisory group had meetings where they actually went on walking tours of different neighborhoods and talked about like, what would these types of changes look like for this street specifically? Um, and I think that was something that was missing from the Arlington process as well. So in conclusion, some recommended best practices is matching involvement uh, planning to public attention as the project proceeds. So what I mean about that by that is uh, in the Arlington example, the plan moved to the county board, but there was still a lot of public discourse and comments on the plan. And the solution at that time, because the staff didn't have uh, any public meet more public meetings planned, it was just going through the formal public hearing process. County board members held community conversations with the public over the course of two and a half months to hear from community members about their concerns. But we're talking like, you know, two months before the vote and staff aren't necessarily driving or directing those conversations. And so I see that as uh, a big limitation on the usefulness of the information being collected in those spaces. Um, if there's that level of public attention that late in the process, then your engagement mechanism needs to be, you know, more focused and constructive to, to really figure out what are the pain points here? Where can we find places of compromise to, you know, get this to a vote? Um, the next, as I mentioned, is goal setting and ongoing performance evaluation. So, you know, setting an intention at the beginning and, and telling your stakeholders what that intention is. Arlington has this great resource saying, uh, here are the four levels of public involvement, and here's what they say. But when you're actually in public meetings, they're not always telling you where you are in that tier. And I think that can be confusing for community members about what their role in that space is as well. Um, and related to that is uh, the transparency and in the performance evaluation, right? So setting that intention at the beginning and telling people, but then also at the end saying, you know, we see all these reports all the time. Like we got so many comments, but it's like, okay, well, how many were you looking for? And who provided those comments, right? That's always the biggest question. Um, so that's another big piece. And then the last two is the stakeholder advisory groups and the place-based um, conversations, I think, are just two big pieces that were missing from Missing Middle that um, could have helped to kind of guide the conversation better. And with that, I would like to say thank you to Sandra and my classmates and my wonderful advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Guerin. Uh, for her support over the last three years, not just the last six months. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Maddie. And um, now, Sarah, is there any questions in the room for Sarah? Looks like on top.
Thanks. Great presentation. Uh, so you had mentioned at a couple of points uh, the different levels of community engagement, uh, but just to clarify, is community ownership the ultimate end goal? Should it be the goal? I don't think so. I think it depends on the process. The context matters a lot. Um, I think in the missing middle conversation, I don't think community ownership should have been the goal. I think that's probably a, a hot take, but um, there's just so much technical analysis underlying all of that, that the community can help advise, like, here are the parts of this policy we, we do not want absolutely that we need compromise on versus here are the parts we accept. But ultimately, I think there is some technical aspect of that that's required and that full community ownership can't really accommodate enough of the like planning part of that that's necessary. Great presentation, like all of your presentations were in grad school, of course, uh, it was expected. Uh, but um, so I lived in um, the Clarendon area uh, from like 2021 to 2022, and I only received one piece of mail regarding to this study once uh, to my apartment. And then I saw like one poster board close to the Clarendon Metro station. And then I would, as a resident of that area, I would have not heard anything about it had I not been going to a grad school at GW in Boston, where we had multiple conversations about it. So maybe in your study, could you talk about like where, like how do you measure people's people discontent or like how, what were the sources that you consulted to kind of get that sense of people weren't necessarily happy with it? Um, because I know that like anecdotally, but I don't, know that I've like necessarily seen a whole lot of coverage about that other than in like very like specialized media outlets that most people or residents would not necessarily follow. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do think there was a lot of coverage in ARL now, the local website for like at the later end of the process about kind of the different groups. And I live like two blocks away from the courthouse. So if there's like a demonstration happening or a lot of people at the county board meeting, I just find out like while walking my dog. Um, so I am fortunate in that regard. Um, and I, I think um, the, the other benefit is I am currently engaged in these spaces. And so even though I'm not engaged in housing politics, um, a lot of the folks coming to the park and rec meeting or sitting on the park and rec commission are single family homeowners in Arlington have lived there for a long time. And they are very aware of the missing middle conversation and they're bringing it to every space they're, they're entering regardless of their position on the topic. Um, so it was very, I think, interwoven throughout the like engagement ecosystem. But I agree, I think the outreach to people who don't live in those single family zoned areas was very lacking in this case study. Um, just off the top of my head, something I remember is during phase two of the project, um, the county held like 10 plus pop-up events around the county uh, and with the intent of getting folks to take a survey. And uh, over 30% of the survey respondents came from one of the census tracts where there were no pop-up events at all. So it's like the most people participating in that survey are coming from one census tract in North Arlington that was not the subject of targeted engagement. And so that speaks a lot to kind of some gaps in how this process approached renters versus homeowners specifically. Good evening. My name is Ugo Jazz. If anyone doesn't know me, and thank you for coming out. Honored to be out here. That was nice. So I did facilitating microgrids and geothermal heating and cooling in the building sector. And um, if it gets a little boring, I don't feel bad if you guys fall asleep. So my research is a study of uh, regions where microgrids and closed loop, specifically closed loop geothermal, geothermal heating has been implemented at scale and utilized. And I want to look at the, I want to look at that environmental, um, at least that uh, policy space and see how it applies here in the US, specifically in the US um, for a variety of reasons. And I want to say thank you to Mr. John Thomas for agreeing to work with me. 
I'm finishing this in the summertime and Mr. Scott Clark who's not here is also gonna be helping me with that. And um, they're great academics and they're a big part of the reason why I decided to go this direction. And um, the big reason why I wanna do this is to eventually figure out how at the base level for a city, zoning codes and even for the state, um, electrical codes, how they can be implemented. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the building sector. Um, this right here on the right side, I got this from the city of Philadelphia. Now, a lot of cities do the same thing where they look at their carbon footprint and they kind of put it out there. And they're always going to tell you buildings are number one source of emission. Buildings are number one source of emission. And so, we make that line to say usually by 2030, we're going to be 50% or all municipal buildings are going to be completely renewable. And then by 2050, everyone says carbon neutrality. It doesn't happen by osmosis, and it's really difficult. Um, I added this here from the European Council. They say 40% of their energy is consumed just by buildings. You guys hear me fine? Oh, good. Ready? Ready? Ah. Ah. Give me three more minutes. Thirty-six percent of greenhouse gases emissions come from buildings, and obviously buildings aren't going anywhere. We need them. Obviously, we have a building stock we're trying to work on, especially here in the states. And if you look up top in the middle, annual global emissions. You see that buildings, and you think that construction and cement is most of it, but actually, just the operation of the building is a big, big, big emitter. So our first conversation is going to be about microgrids. This is a two-part presentation. So the Department of Energy defines a microgrid as a, I'll read it out, a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources within clearly defined electrical boundaries and act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. A microgrid can be connected and disconnected from the grid and enabled to operate from both grid connected and island mode. Island mode meaning that when your utility, when you're, Boundary, your area is not connected to utility, maybe PSAG or um, whatever you have in Maryland, the area still works. <laughs> so, this is a little example. The big thing is the middle, the microgrid controller. This is the software that you would use or that your grid would use to decipher where certain energy is supposed to go. So, you're not attached to the grid, but this piece of software would tell you, hey, let's put in a storage, go for generator and it'll be able to power it. So this is the quarterback, this is the decision maker for your system. Now, this is more what I'm thinking of. I chose this topic because I was really interested when I came here about redevelopment. I was really interested in brownfield development, but powering houses and powering communities is the basics. That's number one. You have energy. And can you do it in a matter that works in a warming planet? So you see they got some solar panels going on and they're still attached to utility up top. Right here is their controller. This is the box that's telling them, okay, we're not connected to the utility. Let's do, let's just use the panel. Let's say the panel, let's say it's dark outside, the battery storage here, all the energy that's not being used while you're attached to utility should be stored there. There's a big storm, you're fine. You're not attached to utility, you're fine. And you're attached to a renewable as well. So you're taking less uh, action off of the national grid, national grid being your regional grid. Now, this might be a little insensitive. This is a prison, but it is a fantastic example of a really, really, really robust microgrid at a community. So this is something you see maybe at a university or a hospital. You have photovoltaics on the top roof. You have a wind turbine attached. You have specific utility, that's PG&E utility that allows you to connect and disconnect from the national grid. You have battery storage, you have a fuel cell, which burns a lot of different types of energy. Um, and you also have a backup generator. So if you have a hurricane, like remember that came through, they should still be fine. Um, God willing. And this is a good example for something. Could you imagine like a school campus, something like maybe in DC, like Cardozo, could something implement something like this. You can have a community center um, that in the sense of uh, disaster relief, this is where you go to. Um, it's a really good resource to have um, various forms of renewable energy. 
This is the last one. So this is to show you that even if you, I know it's blurry, but even if you have renewable sources or micro sources that you can use, a lot of times it'll go straight to the utility and then it'll go to you. In that process, instead of going straight to your controller, you're lo we're losing energy. Because that's the farther you travel energy, the more you lose. So when we talk about this program, the, be the beauty of density, it's able at least that power doesn't have to go too far. So it, this is actually a really good opportunity for some of our denser suburbs, some of our denser cities um, to implement that, especially like on the bottom screen with access to wind turbines, uh, photo technology. And last thing, the basics, those technologies up there are much greener than coal burning power plants. And the fact that you can attach to that and it can work for you during a storm, during a storm, whatever, um, and supply of clean energy is important. Um, you can, we can monetize our grid. If a lot of microgrids are put into the system, then that helps take away from, still going right, right, with this microphone? Good. A little lower? Here. Okay. Island mode is important, and also, at the end of the day, we get to that point of, if we have enough microgrids, we can decarbonize the grid. Maybe 2050, whenever they say, if they can get it. But, some can, but these are some considerations. They're upfront costs. You have to pay for them. They're not free. They come in all kinds of scales, but they still need to be maintained. If you don't have a lot of professionals in your area who know how to install and how to deal with it, it can be a problem for you. Um, and climate. If there's wind not blowing, there's no wind energy. The sun's not out. There's no sun. Um, so we're not at the point where you can just completely get rid of fossil fuels. So have, being able to pull all together is important. And with the technology, if you have battery storage, this is a significant piece of technology. You have to be careful. I know I'd be nervous. I'm an irresponsible guy if I had that in my basement. I have to be careful. And also, when you get energy from wind from, from, uh, from the sun, it's DC, which is direct current, which is different than alternative that you get from the grid. So you have to have the right technology to convert it as well. And that's a big cost. It's not something that's simple. And that's why I think it should be done at the community level rather than having individuals one by one pick it up. Um, we want to pair this with something that's called closed loop geothermal heating and, cool and, and cooling, especially at the district level. Um, last, make this quick. We already know that buildings are the biggest emitters and the biggest use of energy. Now we have that within buildings, heating and cooling is what we spend most of our energy on. This is just a house, but the same thing for commercial uses. These are most of the systems. It's all the same thing. You burn fossil fuels, push out hot something, get in cold energy, you keep it going. Um, what's good about geothermal and what's nice about it is that it actually does not use any fossil fuels to burn. This is a lot. I'm going to tell you what it is. Don't worry about it. The earth underneath is always a constant at 50 degrees. 50 degrees. So all you have to do is pump water on there and it'll warm to 50. If you want warm air, it comes up. We have a compressor. Warm air goes through the compressor, the hot, the compressor compresses the warm geothermal water. This is fluid, not exactly water, but we'll get to that point. Air goes through, hot air comes out, cold air comes in, and then that cold, cool water turns it back into that turns into a gas, turns it back into a liquid, goes back into the earth, goes back to 50 degrees, keeps coming back. When you have it in a loop, just like that, it's just the same liquid going back and forth, heating and cooling. And if you do it in reverse, then you can cool the house. Geothermal uh, systems aren't anything new because open loop is the most common where you pump hot water in, and you pump water out. That is not okay to me. I don't want people digging into aquifers. I don't want people using open uh, water resources when we have basically refrigerant that you can just pump and go in a circle rather than using water and potentially contaminating an aquifer or a spring. This is the open loop. This is what it looks like. You drill down into an aquifer into a ground well. This is what I like, closed loop. This is residential. You'd have this in like your front yard, buried like six feet deep. Um, the point of this presentation isn't to tell people that they should get this, because once again, you'll see soon, I want this at the district level. Vertical loops are what you use for like a school, 
for a commercial building, you have this would have to go maybe hundreds of feet down the ground. Obviously, it's a bigger building. Uh, you can't just put a couple of horizontal coals in the middle. And usually, it's outside the building footprint, which can present an issue. And this is the planner's dream right here, heating an entire district, an entire neighborhood with not one ounce of carbon, somewhere probably some carbon is being emitted. You need an energy station, but the point is that you can use the district. And this is from the, universe, this is from the Department of Energy. Um, they're pushing out a lot of grant money to try and get these projects go through. Um, and this is from Massachusetts, what they're also trying to do, where you can, if you can put all of these wiring through, sorry, these covers through and that's the homes, and then you can heat them, then you don't need furnaces, you don't need boilers, you will need to maintain them. But look at the cost. This is from um, the Rocky Mountain Institute. What we normally do, even air source, which is where you just bring in hot air, all of these don't really match up to the potential that geothermal um, has, especially if it does, especially if it's not an non emitter, low operations cost, um, and you don't use any water. No need to walk into an aquifer. The issue is, once again, if something goes wrong, you got to go into the ground and fix it. You got to maintain it. And there's already systems that will have to be retrofitted. And once again, this is not something that I see individuals doing on their own. Now my case study example. So the whole point of this is that I like these two systems um, as a development pattern going forward as a development standard. Um, I'm working on this throughout the summer, but I've been looking at areas that use both in tandem as well. And one place is Japan, Tokyo. And one of the policies that they have is a carbon price. They say they basically make you pay to emit. And of course, behaviors changed and this happened early but they were able to reduce a lot of emissions. And eventually you can trade those credits and they took with that money that they used and they actually used it to retrofit medium-sized buildings, medium-tenant buildings. And this is a policy that we don't have in the US, but it's something that I looked at. I also looking at um, feeding tariffs of Germany. But the point of my research is to get compile all of these different policy um, examples and case studies uh, across the world and kind of do simpler to what uh, Bianca did, what Sarah did, and have a framework that we can use to kind of facilitate both of those technologies. Um, some frameworks that I'll also be using is the Infrastructure Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the UAE Green Deal, because those are relatively new. Um, those are paying out. That's it's generational money that's going into planning hands. Um, I want to review those and also contrast it with things that I look at. But we also have APA. If you read any playing, um, resource, uh, playing documents, then you also see them having a push for smart infrastructure. Um, so it's kind of be kind of a rubric that I also use to see what's worthwhile. And um, this is important stuff. If we can have, if you really want to have a net zero um, carbon free plant, then it starts with your building sector. Um, it starts with the way you heat them too. And uh, I appreciate you letting me come out here and ramble and talk about nothing for a while. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been an honor. I'm not taking questions. Even though he said he wasn't going to answer them, does anyone have any questions for Ugo? Great presentation, by the way. I do have a few questions. Well, one question. So, um, did you find any health and safety risks compared to uh, the traditional like heating and coolant um, system that we have currently? So, not really. No, it's the same thing. What it comes down to is the professionals that come in and install it. That's one of the major barriers. If you have, if you, like any repair person, if you have somebody who's not experienced or somebody who's not really well versed in environmental studies, you want to make sure you have the right soil, um, you can run into problems. So the big thing is for either application or appliance or whatever form you, whatever form you use, thank you, whatever form you use is just to have the right professionals do it. And once again, probably something that's going to be done at the city level.
Thank you for your presentation, Ugo. Um, I have a question that's similar to Ariel. Um, if this technology isn't that common yet in the US, um, would there also be an issue with finding people who do have the technical capabilities to build and maintain these systems? Thank you. Um, it's not really an issue finding professionals, actually. Um, the issue is that they're not common. The issue is that they're not commonly done at the community level, at the district level, where you have multiple residences, multiple homes, multiple buildings attached. Um, you'll see them, something like a campus, university, hospital, military base, you'll see them, but for them to be applied in, you know, somewhere like Rockville, um, it's going to be tough to get multiple people into it. And it's going to take some, some policy rather than just letting the market decide to do it. Good question. Ugo, awesome job. Uh, my question, you're welcome. My question, it kind of involves a lot of the building stock in the U.S. is old. And um, along with microgrids and uh, ground source heat pumps or geothermal, mm -hmm. um, insulation is a big way to kind of reduce that uh, building energy consumption. Is that kind of going to be incorporated into the research at a so, certain point, or do you have plans for that? So, yeah. When I looked at, when I started this, I did a lot of energy star scorecards, scoreboards. So a lot of times the people you come in to retrofit your building, especially if they're lead people, they're going to try and get you to do your walls or at least add a photovoltaic cut. So if you're going to do something that specific or go in and add that unit, then usually the professionals you're working with are going to want you to go further. All right, we don't have any other questions in the room and there's no online questions. So give it up for Ugo. And now the moment you've all been looking for. Our last presenter, Courtney Carruthers, is going to tell us about technology transfer in, um, in addressing climate change and looking at ecosystem adaptation. So um, specifically, she looked at Africa and transfer. So uh, take it away, Courtney. Hi guys. <laughs> as I stated, or as Sandra stated before, um, my project is on technology transfer, ecosystem-based adaptations. Okay, to start, when you think of technology transfer, what do you think about? When I hear it, or even the line itself, I'm just like, this is definitely like the open wide web something engineered, something bolted into the ground, taking two people to put something together. But I bring this question to you. What if it's not? What if it's a little bit like something that you can grow in your backyard? The premise of technology transfer originated from um, a 1992 conversation. It's as old as that, if not older. But it was kind of made popular in 2016 Climate Corps, um, I'm sorry, the 2016 um, uh, Paris Climate Agreement. And the idea or the premise behind it was more developed nations can provide assistance in addressing climate change issues to developing nations. Now we know that the United States, as big as it is, are one of the greatest releasers of greenhouse gas emissions. But we also know that a lot of smaller nations are even larger nations that may not have the financial backing that we do take the brunt of the emissions that we release. And, there, and therefore, we have technology transfer. And for the premise or for the basis of my project, we're looking at cities. So we're looking at United States cities and how they can provide ecosystem-based adaptations for developing cities and developing nations. A little bit about my project and my hypothesis. Um, we're going to be looking at ecosystems in general, 
and also ecosystem-based adaptation. So you'll hear me say it a lot, but just to shorten ecosystems, ecosystem-based adaptations, I'll be saying EBA sometimes. My hypothesis is going to look at it from the vision of technology transfer and using the approach of the ecosystem to provide ecosystem-based adaptations or EBAs to combat or assist in combating coastal flooding. When you think of the ecosystem, I want you to look around you. See the person beside you, but also look at the fabric, look at the floor, think of the things that you see out in the atmosphere because they matter. That includes the bugs that bite you or the ants on the ground. When you step in a puddle, the organisms that are in there, everything matters. And that's the thought that I want you to take with you when you travel, travel with me through this process. Ecosystems encompass everything, the things that you don't think that matter. Just because you don't rely on the land that you're walking on doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't. And that's why it's important. Ecosystem-based adaptations come from the earth. And most of the time, because of deforestation or our lack of caring for the environment, we overlook them. But they matter. And they're actually some of our best sources of defenses in combating climate change. OK, so something's going on with my slide, because that's gone. Um, but planting in the ecosystem is vital. And it's missing a few phrases, but it's just definitions. What I want you to take from those definitions that are missing is that they all align similar, similarly, and they all make you question what you know about the environment and how you approach it. Meaning, it's important to look at the have integrity when you as a planner are planning for the next city or the region or even your community to think about everything, not just the dog parks, but the dogs that actually go there and don't have an owner, are the bugs that are there, are the feces that are left over because someone was irresponsible. It makes you or requires you, even if you're not a planner, to have integrity and to think of everything. That's what the ecosystem asks of you. Ah, there it is. <laughs> so for the purpose of this capstone and I do say this, yes, so um, you look at these, these different ecosystems. There are a variety of ecosystems, but for the purpose of this one, it will be looking at coastal, wetland, and urban areas. Um, and as I previously said, or Sandra said, we'll be looking at the coastal city of Lagos, Nigeria. It's important to note almost as much as you can about a place that you're studying, or at least that's my opinion. And that's why I studied as much as I could. Lagos, Nigeria is a very interesting place, which I have not had the pleasure of going to, but I think that it's very rich in so much more than what meets the eye. The city itself is named after its state, its state and it's located within the country of Nigeria on the continent of Africa. The city itself is a coastal city that lies very low, about three feet above sea level. It's low lying, it's muddy, it's sandy, but it's rich. Ironically, it holds about 15 billion people. Wow. Give or take a few people because Nigeria has not had a census since 2006, but they're doing one this year, so don't be alarmed. Um, the ecosystem is made up of everything, wetlands, coastlands, and an urban area. And it's high risk for flooding. But additionally, it has a rich culture with various ethnic, ethnic tribes. But the largest one, as of right now, without a census, is the Yoruba tribe. This tribe um, kind of coined the name of the region Yoruba Island, which is very interesting to me. But as I said, it's a string of, it's a string of islands. It's made up of a string of islands sitting very low. But one of the challenges is their lack of housing policies or the lack of enforced housing policies, meaning that developers will build on reclaimed wetlands, wetlands that are susceptible to flooding. Um, 
Some people may live in homes that don't have access to roads, sanitation, um, or anything that we consider a modern convenience. Um, and coastal flooding doesn't make it any better, making them more susceptible to diseases, um, illnesses, death, which is why providing something that a community can actually address rather than the government is impactful. Um, one of the things that ecosystem planning addresses is its support for TEK, our traditional ethnic knowledge. It is a thought of medical officials, medical research, that if you utilize ethnic, traditional, cultural, or tribal knowledge, that that could actually combat climate change because the secrets and the knowledge are there. But most of the time, like our government, or most governments, it's not based in science, so it won't be supported by policy. But the ecosystem supports it because it provides solutions that originate from within the ecosystem. Coastal flooding. Coastal flooding is something that we don't think that we, or most of us don't think that we would ever actually experience. But in reality, 40% of the world will actually live about 62 miles from a coast. Somehow, you could easily be impacted by coastal flooding. By 2100, maybe not your kids, maybe your grandchildren, could be paying a debt that could come from anywhere in the world that could equate to $14.2 trillion simply because we don't have any answers yet just to combat the rising sea level, the high tides, and ultimately the coastal flooding. Coastal flooding is attributed to things, of course, by climate change, but also sea level rise, high tides, hurricanes, anything. If, the, if it gets too hot, thermal expansion could push that water onto land. Specifically, Charleston, North Carolina, I'm sorry, Charleston, South Carolina, often combats coastal flooding, high tides, and their sewage could easily be pushed back if they didn't have advanced systems. This is just a diagram of what coastal flooding could look like. Your house doesn't have to be exactly in a certain spot or on the edge of a cliff to just be impacted by coastal flooding. It ranges and its impacts are detrimental and they vary. And before we go forward, the United States and the globe all use coastal gray infrastructure. There is nothing wrong with them, I must say. It's protected us for over a millennia, dating back to the Roman Empire, actually. But what you must realize is coastal infrastructure was ma is made of steel and stone, but it doesn't fully adapt to the rising sea level. It doesn't fully adapt to the changing climates and it ages. So it doesn't adapt to future generations and what they may bring to the table if we don't help fix something now. So the coastal gray infrastructure, I also want you to note, is that if you notice, they're all kind of structured in a certain way to blend with the water. But the person or the originator of some of these coastal infrastructures they design them to look just like ecosystem-based adaptations. The way that they vertically go up, the way that they go out, the way they are structured, they will, you'll see some similarities. The ecosystem-based adaptations that we'll be discussing today are the mangrove forest, the oyster reef, and the salt marshes. Before we go on into my case studies, I want you to understand that Think of yourself as an eco-based, ecosystem-based adaptation. You're not perfect. You have flaws, you can be challenged, and you can be hurt. You may not win in everything. You may not be successful at everything. But when you're put in the fight and you're passionate about it, you will see some type of success. There's purpose there. Um, my first case study is oyster reefs out of Mobile Bay, Alabama. Oyster reefs are a natural water filter. They are also a place 
or a habitat where people, I mean, beings actually live. And most importantly, they buffer waves and height. They absorb that wave energy, decreasing the power and the impact that may actually go into homes or on coastlines and actually not allowing erosion to occur and decreasing you by a couple of dollars as well. It'll be helpful in the end. Mobile Bay, Mobile Bay, Alabama is actually located on the coastal area of the Gulf area. It's a lagoon, it's a bay. The largest city is in Mobile, Alabama. Um, its coastal flooding is medium. I wonder why. Um, and just like Lagos, it has an urban ecosystem. It has a wetland ecosystem and it has a coastal ecosystem. But what's most important are the events that took place. They had back-to-back -back hurricanes, which actually decreased the oyster reefs below. And they also had deep water horizon, which was an oil spill. Unfortunately, because of that oil spill, they lost about, between Texas and Alabama, they lost about 8 billion in oysters. Not just reefs, in oysters. And this is important because over a few decades ago, Alabama would bring in on a yearly basis about a million pounds of oysters, just in general. They're harvesting, they're fishing, they're just, this is just what they do. So it's, it's easy, it was at that point easy to come by, but there was a decline because of the hurricanes, but there was a disaster and a drought of oysters because of an oil spill, negatively impacting it across the area. Because of that, there was no reef and flooding. But over the years, after several hurricanes, they have seen a success rate. In recent years, there has been about a 51 to 90% wave height decrease due to oyster reefs being restored. And because of wave energy, there has been, because of oyster reefs combating wave energy, there has been a 76 to 99% decrease, eliminating the idea of coastal flooding in that area or damage. Um, this is just a diagram of how actually oyster reefs work. You'll see the breakwater. And if you remember the last uh, great infrastructure slide, you saw that the breakwater was designed similar to this. It's absorbing the wave energy. And as you can see, the green plants are still growing because of it. If not, erosion will occur. You'll lose more land. But because of oyster reefs, it's preserving the land and expanding. My next case study is mangroves. Some of you may have heard of it. Very common in Florida. Mangroves are carbon sequestration. They do carbon sequestration, which is not something we're talking about tonight, but it is beneficial. Uh, of course, it also creates a habitat and it decreases wave energy and absorbs coastal flooding. It's challenged by sea, rock, sea level rise as well as deforestation. So you play a part. But what's most important is Lee County, Florida. Lee County, Florida has suffered several different hurricanes. It's Florida. Um, coastal erosion, things happen. But what's most important about the mangroves are the fact that the people there see their value and desire to protect it. For eight years, a currently a um, for eight years currently, a developer has tried to remove the current space of mangroves, about 30 acres. They want to build about 55 houses there. It's on the coastline, very beautiful, very rich community, Fort, Fort Myers, if I'm not mistaken. And the people refused it. I mean, it would benefit them if it, would, it might bring up their property value, if nothing else. It's Florida. But it didn't. They refused it. One resident said that they refused it because mangroves saved their lives. Because of them, because of the mangroves, they didn't lose anything to their house and they didn't lose their lives while people down the street that are at the golf course saw feet of water in their house where they may have seen an inch if nothing else but a down tree. So at this point for this effort mangroves saved them more than a billion dollars in damages and losses. Um, this is 
an example of a mangrove um, and how they're absorbing the water. If you see at the end, there is actually nothing. It's no movement, no erosion. My last case study is salt marshes, Jamaica Bay Park, New York. It's beautiful. A salt marsh is a bit different from mangroves. Um, it's a wetland. It still consists of the same three ecosystems. It's New York. The city itself is built in between, I mean, sorry, the um, salt marshes in between uh, Brooklyn and Queens. Great place. Um, it absorbs water. It absorbs that salt water. It absorbs, absorbs the flood water, taking on the impact. Or at least that's what it's supposed to do. Unfortunately, there isn't a success story in this location. Why? Because sometimes we forget. The park itself lacks abilities. It hasn't been restored in years, but it is a place that most people want to travel. So as of right now, they're doing a restoration to rebuild this place because it no longer is protecting. But it's still a habitat. It's still valued. And most recently, they, they're putting in a plan for about 55 million to restore it. Because without it, they saw Hurricane Sandy and they saw Hurricane Irene. And those locations were flooded where at one point it protected the places around it. But because of a lack of investment, because of location, it went without its proper needs. Just like us, EBAs need attention too. This is a wetland, salt marsh, and this is how it can protect the coastline and population. So as I kind of summarize everything, these are my recommendations. I have four. The first one is for, of course, the city of Lagos, wetland restoration. But EBAs are indicative of their location. They can't thrive unless they're in their proper ecosystem. Even though they're adaptable, getting perfect is pretty attainable for them. Lagos has a swampy, muddy area, which is great, because they can easily restore the swamp area around their lagoons. And what's most important from this is in, rest in restoring this, they could easily plant mangroves, which repopulate themselves and would be a great source for protection for coastal flooding. Because mangroves can easily go grow, as you can see. And there's a way to disperse the salt and the fresh water back into the ocean and also allow the mangroves and anything else in that area that needs vegetation to grow. My second option is artificial oyster reefs. This one is very important because globally oyster reefs are on the decline. You can't really find them in every area, but you can create a reef where oysters are attracted to and they build upon themselves. Dead or alive, an oyster is still beneficial to its ecosystem because once it dies, it can stay on that reef and some other oyster can build off of it. But one of the challenges is there aren't oysters. And if you don't have anything to lay on or substrates, they die off, especially in infancy. So some of the options are a cement substrate or a por porcelain substrate or a limestone substrate. And I say these with caution because Nigeria is one of the biggest countries and producers of cement. And they also have a large inventory of limestones. But those things are also contributors to pollution and also contributors to air pollution and water pollution, which makes people extremely sick, as well as anything living in the ecosystem. So I also pose a secondary option, which is non-plastic natural fibers with hard substrates and larvae. It's basically creating a bag but we don't want to use plastics and we want to use something that's grown within the ecosystem. The native, can I, I may be pronouncing that wrong, 
is grown in Nigeria. And it's something that can blend like burlap and it can be braided and you can fill it with rocks predominantly and old oyster shells and fill it with larvae. And that will attract more, more oysters to the project, as well as jute, which is non-native, but can be found in Nigeria. And secondly, you could also create an oyster fence through recycled oysters, if you have enough. It's just an option. Secondly, which is one of my favorite, is the Crassotree chulupia, which is the, actually the West African mangrove oyster. It's native to Nigeria, and specifically Lagos. It's a mangrove, but predominantly an oyster. It can be cultured or, or bred, but essentially the tree grows with oysters on it. What you see behind me are actually oysters growing from the tree roots of this tree. They attach on it because they need a habitat, but in reality, they create an ecosystem-based adaptation that's unrealistic and has way too many benefits. But it's a combination, it's a hybrid, and it's a plant, something that can grow and protect coastal flooding. And lastly, we have hybrid, which is great infrastructure and ecosystem-based adaptations. It's using possibly a structure of oyster reefs with cement, are salt marshes with some type of great infrastructure. Lagos has a lot of great infrastructure that shouldn't be torn down simply because you have alternatives, but it can assist the great infrastructure by providing new sources, new forms, and it could actually save a few lives. This actually completes my project. I would like to thank my parents, of course, and also my advisors, um, Rachel Johnson, as well as um, Sandra and Mesba. Thank you. Questions for Courtney in the room? Anto? Okay, maybe. Um... We can get started with the question online. I can't really read it. Oh, I'll just go with mine. Great presentation, Courtney. Could you speak more about like the debt when you started off your, your presentation, you were talking about future generations having to pay this enormous debt and throughout the presentation, you had a couple of like very significant and dollar amounts of like either um, because of the damage that it could cause or the, or the damage that it has already caused. Could you speak more about like in your research uh, about measurement uh, or what were the indicators of how did we land in these dollar amounts and how we could leverage that type of analysis to possibly raise funds to implement this type of solutions that you've recommended? Right, so thank you. Um, one of the ways that they look at it is insurance. So if you don't have insurance, that's one of the ways that we don't know. So the number actually could be greater. Um, insurance actually tells us how much you're spending um, for floods, especially in certain areas. But the largest dollar amount came from an economist that I was studying. And then also I looked at some um, articles from Nigeria from an economist as well, because I'm not familiar with their economy. So I wanted to know how much that would be. But the economist looked at every country that could potentially have um, flood risk, which is everywhere in the globe, but also they looked at like how much funding they would have. It's known that most um, smaller nations or less known nations may spend less, but their body counts are much higher than ours, unfortunately. So they're looking at that, not just, and unfortunately that it doesn't include everything. So that number actually could be greater. It's looking at the countries that have that information. So it's limiting, it's, it's a bit biased. This is from SCP alum Garrett Johnson again. First, why are you great? <laughs> Second, have you thought about being peer reviewed to expand on this important topic? Um, I found this out this morning, uh, so I'm considering.
So you used an acronym earlier in the presentation. I think it was EKT. Like oh, for for traditional. Um, yeah, yeah. And you had mentioned that um, it's not often implemented because it's not scientific. Right. Um, so this is more of a thought question, I guess. That, um, but how do you think we should reconcile something like this, which is, um, you know, an approach that anecdotally appears to work with the need to employ evidence-based approaches when you're dealing at the, you know, a large scale? That's a good question. Um, I was actually a little bit startled by it as well, but I thought about myself personally. Um, traditional knowledge isn't just for other nations, it's also in America, from the South. So I know that when it comes to elderly, we don't always listen to them, but their knowledge is just as traditional, um, but it's not scientific based. And so just like traditional ethnic knowledge, our grandparents pass down information that we don't listen to. And I think it starts at home it's with the individual, with ecosystem-based adaptations, it's more so community oriented and actually being able to be respectful at that point and listening, I think would start um, with a lot of, um, with some African nations and some American places. It said in a lot of the articles that I was reading that um, there's a distrust and a disconnect within the government because traditional ethnic knowledge and the people who utilize it don't feel supported. And so I feel like the first step is for the government or for city officials to actually support that. If they support it, then more people will be open to providing that knowledge. If they don't feel like it's shunned or if it's less than, because if not, sometimes that knowledge will die out and it won't be used. But if you respectfully go to a person and listen, then they may actually give you something that could take you far. All right, that concludes uh, Courtney's presentation and give her a hand. And I wanna invite all my presenters back up to the front. Ladies and gentlemen, folks of all stripes, I give to you our 2023 spring graduating class. Thank you all for your wonderful presentations this evening and for your hard work that went into these capstone presentations and your capstone projects. I invite you all up to the third floor for some light refreshments. Um, it's just cupcakes and cookies, but it's yummy. So come on up. Thank you all to our guests who joined us online. We're so happy you could join us from near and far. Thank you for your attention and your questions. And thanks to all of you.